Welcome to the slideshow for Unit 6. Unit 6 deals a little bit of very early history of the atom and actually some of the 1800s types of things that went on, trying to get an idea of how uh, these compounds that we have are going to be made. And so we'll take a look at, uh, this goes in sections 2.1 and 2.2 in the textbook. You might want to go take a look at those sections before you do the PowerPoint or look at them afterwards, whichever way you prefer to do it, but it gives more information than what you'll see here. Uh, in Unit 6, we're going to look at two things, basically. We're going to look at the atomic views that were in the Greek times, just to briefly, just see what the ideas were back then. We're also going to look at the laws of the 18th century, uh, actually it should be 19th century, 18th century, that led to the concept of atoms that we deal with today. In the Greek times, uh, this is back, we're talking about 300, 400 before the Christian era, uh, so we're talking 24, 2500 years ago, somewhere around there. Uh, there were a couple different contrasting views of what matter was made of. There's Leucippus and Democritus. Leucippus was actually Democritus' student, and there was Aristotle. And Aristotle, of course, we've heard of. The others you probably have not heard of that much. All of these lived around the 300 to 400 BC era. They're kind of contemporaries. Uh, Leucippus and Democritus favored the view that matter was made out of incredibly small particles called atoms. Whereas Aristotle believed that matter was continuous, that there were no small particles to it. And it's sort of like if you stand back and look over a, a sandy beach from a distance, you can't tell for sure what that sandy beach is made of. But as you get closer and closer and closer, you can see the particular pieces of sand uh, on that beach. And so the view of uh, Leucippus and Democritus is more attuned with what we actually see on a beach, if you think about it, than what that of Aristotle was. And you get smaller and smaller in matter, and you look at it, you'll start to see that we're going to find out that it also is made up of smaller particles just like uh, a beach is made out of smaller particles of sand. Um, then we come up into the 1700s. Let's say it is the 18th century. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Antoine Lavoisier uh, was doing a series of experiments. He found that in any experiment, any chemical change uh, that, that happened, the changing anything to anything, that the amount of matter that you have, the mass of matter you had to start with, is conserved. If you start with 50 grams of stuff, you end up with 50 grams of stuff. It may all be different. It may have gone different places, maybe here, maybe there, but if you did all of your accounting well, in the end of it, you find out that your mass is conserved. So this is, con this is actually summarized what we call the law of conservation of mass. You've probably heard of that one. It's not very hard to figure out. It is no matter what you do, you don't make or destroy matter. Is it going to be there in the end? And so the statement of it briefly looks like this. Matter is neither created nor destroyed in a chemical change. And it's also neither created or destroyed in what we call physical change, which will come up later. So let's take a, let's take a look at this on the next slide. My zinc sulfide over here has a composition that has zinc and sulfur in a ratio of like 35 to 17.1. Any sample of zinc sulfide will have that same ratio in it of zinc to sulfur. Well, so he summarizes and said, well, a compound always contains the same elements in certain definite proportions and in no other combination. So let's go back and visit zinc sulfide again. And we do that. Up here is the one that looks familiar. This is 35 grams of zinc. This is 17.1 grams of sulfur. They produce 52.1 grams of zinc sulfide. Well, I could also take and say, well, there's no reason that my zinc has to be confined to 35 grams or my sulfur has to be confined to 17.1 grams. Let's do this. Let's keep my 35 grams here and let's put make it 50 grams of sulfur and see what happens in that case. What happens in that case is my 35 grams of zinc react with my 50 grams of sulfur to make, once again, 52.1 grams of zinc sulfide, just like we had up here. But now... I have 32.9 grams of sulfur left over. Only 17.1 grams reacted. That's all it could take. So this zinc sulfide here has the exact same composition as zinc sulfide here. It doesn't matter how much sulfur, how much zinc I put in, I get that same compound. I just have something left over. And over here, if I start with 45 grams of zinc, so now I have more zinc in it. And over on this side, I take and I look at it and say, okay, I'm going to find 17.1 grams again. When these guys react, I still form 52.1 grams of zinc sulfide. And I have now 10 grams of zinc left over because only 35 of it got tied up in making the compound. And so this is a law of definite proportions. These compounds have a definite, uh, a definite ratio in which they go together. Uh, it doesn't have to be 35 and 17. I can take 100 and, of zinc and 200 of 
sulfur and put them together, I'd make more zinc sulfide, but the ratio in there would always be this 35 to 17.1 number. It's like about 2.2 .2 to 1 or something like that. All right, so that uh, eight parts of mass by mass of oxygen for every one part by mass of hydrogen. So if I had some samples here, samples one, two, three, and four, I said, well, I don't know what these are. I don't know if these are water or not. I could get a sense of it by looking at the mass ratios. Here, if I have a mass of oxygen, it's 85 grams, and here it's 10.6. That ratio is 8.0. That's what I expect to see in water. Same thing here, 0.36 grams, 0.045 grams, ratio is 8.0. But in this example, in three, my ratio is not 8.0, and in four, my ratio is not 8.0. What that tells me is, Samples three and four absolutely cannot be water because water can only have an eight to one mass ratio in it. These two samples up here could be water. It turns out they could also be something else. But, but the two below, three and four, cannot be water just based on the fact that every sample of that compound, every sample of that substance has the same ratio in it. And now if I look at what's called the law of multiple portions, you know, we had concentration of mass, we have uh, definite proportions, now multiple proportions. John Dalton came up with this, we'll see him again in chapter, in unit 7 a little bit, and he took the law of definite proportions and realized that sometimes you can combine things together and get them together in more than one ratio, okay, in one set of proportions, with each proportion corresponding to a different compound. Example of that, uh, lots of words on this slide, but you may know, you may have heard of hydrogen peroxide, water is H2O, Hydrogen peroxide is H2O2. The mass of oxygen to hydrogen and water is 8 to 1. The mass of uh, oxygen to water and hydrogen peroxide is 16 to 1. So water is going to be this 8 to 1 thing again. Hydrogen peroxide is going to be 16 to 1. They have that, they, they can combine in two ratios and two of these whole number <coughs> ratios. And these are two very distinct compounds. Hydrogen peroxide is a very different animal than what water is, sorry, it's not an animal, different substance than what water is going to be. And so this ultimately, this kind of fixed mass ratio idea ultimately led to John Dalton's atomic theory, which will be our topic in Unit 7.